today we're going to look at uh, the title of the article is putting the clock in bead. Uh, so it, it's a little bit more elaborate than that because you have to understand how escapements work so that you know when you're putting the clock in bead what that's doing. So uh, it's going to be a two part thing. One where we look at all the different escapements and the secondary part is where we actually go through the process of putting the clock in beat and the methodology used to do that. Uh, now, if you, there's another article I had written on checking the function of an anchor escapement that goes into the anchor escapement in very deep theory, even shows you how to draw one because I had to go through that process to make a new one for a grandfather clock last year. So you can look at that if you're so inclined. So today we're gonna to cover seven different types of escapements. We're gonna look at an anchor escapement. We're gonna do both the theory and look at an actual real one and how they work. This is from an old grandfather clock, I would suspect in the early, from the early 1800s. We're gonna look at a, a Hermely deadbeat escapement out of a, a 141.020 from the 1970s. We're gonna look at a Volumi adjustable pallet deadbeat. It's out of a German movement, I believe, probably from the 1890s. We're gonna look at a Brokaw escapement. This is out of a New Haven open escapement movement. And we're gonna look at the American bench strip type. It's from around the turn of the century, around 1900. We're gonna quickly look at a platform balance, which is a lever type escapement, similar that's used in a pocket watch. And then we're gonna quickly look at an auto beat, which is actually a dead beat, but it has a, a function that they come out with in the 70s. So when they shipped the clock to you, you just gave the pendulum a big swing and it would automatically put itself in beat. So that's our goal for today. So we're, we're gonna cover the functional theory, which is how they work, not so much as if you wanna draw one, you, you can do that later. So we're gonna be looking at the pallet face angles, the lock, the drop, and why the escapements are shaped the way they're shaped. <clears throat> so the first one that we're gonna cover is the anchor escapement, uh, because it was one of the first ones developed and other people altered that anchor escapement to come up with the other types of escapements. Uh, so I'm going to follow the article fairly close so that if you want, you can go back and read it and it should make sense to you. So we got a lot to cover today, so we're going to move right along. So initially, I'm going to I'm going to read uh, out of the article a little kind of summary and some of that won't make sense, but it will as we as we go on. So putting the clock in beat simply means we're gonna make each escapement pallet, the entrance and the exit pallet, uh, deliver equal power to the uh, pendulum. So that's what it means when you say you put a clock in beat. So as the escape wheel rotates, it interacts with the pallets creating enough energy to the pendulum to account for the power loss due to gravity and wind and, and uh, other factors. So to understand when you're actually putting it in a beat, we need to understand how the escapement, its design and factors affect that. So I have a diagram up on the board, which is, uh, it's not really up on the board, I guess it's up on the camera. So I'll, I'll just quickly point out. So this is the pivot point for the pallets. This rotates, we can tell because this is the entrance. So this is actually rotating clockwise. So this would be our entry pallet and these are the escape wheel teeth. This is the exit pallet. These are the cross out spokes on the wheel and this is the hole where it's mounted on the arbor. And that's the escape wheel. So, so I'll kind of read over this summary and then we'll tear it apart as we're looking at escapement. So a driven escape wheel tooth, which is one of these teeth, it presses against the pallet face and forces it away. That's what the escape wheel's job is, is to approach the pallet and force it away. So this allows the escape wheel to rotate until the other pallet interacts, which is the exit one. And that has to be X number of teeth plus a half 
because you see here where it's half and this is right on because it has to fall down in the hole in between. So it's X number of teeth plus a half on the, uh, and that's one of the checks you'll do if you're having trouble with an escapement. So, so this interaction keeps happening back and forth and the, and the pendulum keeps swinging or the, uh, the escapement keeps swinging and transfers through the crutch down to the pendulum and the pendulum keeps swinging. And so there's a time period. Now, if you look closely here, you'll see a little gap between the tooth and the face. That's called the drop. So that time period when it's not touching because it's fallen off the edge of this tooth. So that period, that's called a drop when there's nothing happening. Uh, so the escape wheel is actually free to rotate. So it's important how much drop you have. There's a drop on the entrance and a drop on the exit. So if the escapement is set up correctly, the drops have to be brief and equal on either side. And we're actually gonna do some measuring today in a real example. Because you want, because that drop is actually wasted energy because nothing's happening to the escapement when that's dropping. All that the escape wheel is doing is picking up speed and hitting that pallet face really hard. So we want to keep that drop to a minimum. So a large drop means that instead of driving the pendulum, the escape wheel teeth are simply hitting the pallets hard and digging uh, pits in them. So, so this tells us that the escapement is the most critical and sensitive part of the clock. And people often wonder why you don't just add more power to the escapement. Like as they get dirty, they slow down. And, and that's the first thing people want to do is add more power to it. But then you're going to influence the pendulum because the harder this escape wheel tooth hits this pallet face, the more it's going to jolt that. And that jolt gets transferred down through the crutch to the pendulum. The pendulum shakes. And then you have erratic timing. And because if you look at the, the more expensive a clock, the <clears throat> shorter the pendulum swing and all that, like we discussed last week, uh, uh, <clears throat> we did some measurements that uh, a deadbeat only swings six degrees, which isn't very much. So now let's break all this down, how that actually works. So, so those are the parts. So we're going to be talking about the entrance pallet and the exit pallet and the escape wheel teeth. So keep that in mind. So here's a better picture. See, the, uh, the anchor escapement was uh, developed around 1650. So, so it's a quite old theory that they come up with. So we're gonna look at, okay, so the entrance pallet. So here we see the entrance pallet. So it's gonna push away the sloped escape wheel too. So this entrance pallet, this escape wheel tooth is gonna to push that away because it has a pivot point up here. So, and it's swinging, so it's gonna push that away. So as the tooth drops off this point, there was a short drop. So down in this diagram, you can see it. It's at the point and it's ready to drop off. And there's a space between this tooth and that tooth called the drop. And, and when it's coming up to the entrance, you'll see the same thing. So remember the drop is the, the point that the, either the escape wheel teeth or the pallet faces are touching each other, are not touching each other. So, so this whole process, when it's rocking back and forth, it causes the escapements around and then given the pendulum, that's how the pendulum gets its swing. So you can see the geometry of all this is very critical to get it to work back and forth without interfering. Now, on these, uh, there's only slope faces on the escape wheel. You can see that this is a slope face and the tooth is coming up. This is a slope face because the tooth is coming down this direction. The, the escape wheel teeth never stop the escapement from moving. So that escape wheel is always moving either forward or backwards. So the pendulum, so what happens the pendulum, uh, 
I did my homework and I actually made some real uh, So this is actually out of that 18. Now I have clay on that, the whole thing, so I can do a measurement. So I'll, I'll briefly move that away. So, so here we can see the, uh, let me blow that up just a touch more. Okay, so this is actually moving counterclockwise because I had to put it in upside down because, because the arm was sticking out. This is the crutch. So, this in this particular one is moving counterclockwise. So you can see the escape wheel teeth and you see this sloped surface. So the escape wheel is coming up and it's pushing. You can see the pendulum swinging to the right. So it's being pushed to the right from that tooth. Now, if you look over on the left, the exit one, that escape wheel tooth now is gonna push that the other direction, and you can see over here, it's coming back up and catching that one. So if we put that on a tooth there, you can, you can actually see the gap. So that's the actual drop. Now that drop, that drop should actually be between five to 10% of the pitch. So in this particular case, the pitch is the, from the point of one escape wheel tooth to the other one. And I measured that at 125 thou. So 10% of that would be 12 and a half thou. So we should be somewhere between six and 12 thou drop to follow good working conditions. Uh, so you can actually see, you see how much, how much drop there is. Now the, You've heard, uh, <clears throat> so you can see how that causes, the, an interesting thing is if I just, you can see it, it actually goes backwards when I rock it back and forth. Now I made this jig so that I, it's adjustable so I can move the depth back and forth. Uh, now there's only slope faces on the escape wheel. So the escapement from moving never stops. So, the, so here's the funny part about an anchor escapement. Uh, you've heard people talk about recoil and the problems it causes. Uh, we'll just quickly put that diagram there. So when the recoil is happening it, through the drop, it's hitting and that's what this dark hole represents because that tooth is coming in and because of the drop, it picks up speed and it hits right in this area. And then it goes backwards a little bit and where's this part out? This is the recoil wear. And then it changes direction. And then where's the normal wear down the pallet face? So let's look at that, how that really happens. So we've got, okay, so remember, this is the entrance pallet. So we got a scape wheel tooth here coming up. So it's pushing the pendulum to the right. Now, now that pendulum has got a swing, so it's gonna wanna keep going and you see it hits and you see it, when it hits, you see that wants to go backwards. Cause remember, this is a counterclockwise movement. So it takes a while for that pendulum to change direction. Then all of a sudden it changes direction. And now the exit one over on this side is actually pushing it away. Now the pendulum is still swinging and wanting to go. And you can see it's gonna go a bit and the escape wheel goes backwards and then it changes direction and comes down. So it keeps doing that process. But what happens, the problem with this escapement is, is the pendulum is going one direction and it wants to change because the pendulum is keep going and then it changes direction. But you can see, now you see, and that's what they mean by the slope. You see that whole slope, it's sliding and the pendulum has to move. And it does that on either face. If I put it on the entrance one, you can see that if that pendulum works backwards, I mean, if the escapement works backwards or the escape wheel, the pendulum is gonna move. 
but the pendulum has built up force. So it's trying to swing. And that's where you get that recoil action because it, it's actually trying to turn all the gears backwards in that escapement. Uh, now it, it's a small amount, but if you look at a really old grandfather clock, you'll actually see the second hand turn backwards a little bit. And, and the amount that it turns backwards is the recoil amount. So hopefully that's clear. So the pendulum is moving one a direction when the escape wheel tooth hits the pallet face. So the pendulum continues moving a bit further before it changes the direction, even though the pallet is trying to make it change direction. So it comes up, it hits that face, but the So it's going backwards here, the recoil, and then it's going and it hits the exit one, but it's, so then it changes direction and comes back. So it, it takes a while before that actually changes direction. Hopefully that's clear on what, uh, so if we go back to our diagram here, So there's three areas of wear. I just went over it. So that's the recoil. You can see the hole that is digging. And if you look at some of the old grandfather clocks, you'll actually see quite a hole in some of them. And the bigger the, uh, and that's why you want to minimize that recoil because uh, uh, minimize the drop. So the, the bigger the drop, the more to minimize that recoil. So the drop should be kept to a minimum. Uh, because the smaller the drop, the less speed it can pick up to impact that pallet face. So it causes less wear. Now we're gonna look at the angles. So you can see the pallet face here. Now this line here, that represents, uh, if you remember your cosines and trig, that represents uh, an angle of uh, 0 0.707 is the, you, you take the diameter of the escape wheel and you take 0 0.707 of it. And then, that, and then when you draw a line from the pallet face to here, you get into this when you're drawing them and designing them. But this gives you a reference to actually measure the angle uh, because the ideal angle for, these escapements to work at is 45 degrees, which is the angle that the tooth approaches the pallet face. So you can see this is roughly 45 degrees. And the same thing here, it's coming down. So this angle here is 45 degrees. Now people try to bend them and adjust them as they wear and do different things. And those angles get, get out of, uh, so, by, so by using trig, we can make, draw a, a secondary circle that's 0 0.707 times the diameter. And then that represents that angle. Uh, now, if you're listening to an old grandfather clock, some people to put a clock in beat, they go by the sound of it. They go by the loudness of the tick. You have to be careful with that because if the drops, if they've worn and somebody's adjusted something and the drops aren't equal, you're gonna get a, a different sound. So if you're using an electronic beat setter, it's actually measuring the time, not the sound or the, the level of the sounds. It's actually measuring the time between the beats to use it. So, so you have to be careful when you're dealing with old clocks that listening to them to try to put them in beat to get the sound even uh, isn't always good. So the reasons that they, they come up with for a 45 degree angle is, is if you make the angle steeper, then the tooth is gonna go straighter towards that. And then you're gonna lose power because the tooth is gonna hit it and not know what to do. So, but if you come in at a lower angle, it's gonna move that away easier, but it will have less power uh, and it has to move the escapement less for it to unlock the teeth. So, so, the 45 degree was a compromise that they come up with.
So let's actually measure with my little thing here. We can actually measure the angle. I'll show you how to measure that. I'll get my clay. Um, so we're going to measure. So I'm going to put that, you see there on the left, I'm going to put the escape wheel tooth just at the point where it's ready to drop off the escapement. So I'll lock it with my clay. So now I made these little plastic straight edges so you can see. Now, if you look closely, you'll see a bright line. That's my 0 0.707 line that I put the, uh, the uh, escape wheel in the lathe and I measured it in. I measured the diameter of the escape wheel and then uh, took 0 0.707 of that. So the entrance pallet face, if I put a line across that, you'll see that I'm gonna have to get me tweezers. So I'm just kind of roughly following the angle of that pallet face. So you can see it's roughly 45 degrees. Now these pallet faces, sometimes they curve them slightly. So you got to kind of every set out. So the entrance is roughly 45 degrees. So it's okay. So to do the exit one, you do basically the same thing, except you put the tooth on the other side. And then this one, we'll measure coming down. Anyway, you get the idea. It's, so it's roughly, it's roughly the same 45 degrees. So, so we can assume that nobody's damaged or bent or bent this. So that's how you measure the angles to see whether the angles, now the one that I had to replace the escapement for was up to 65 degrees and they weren't even. So it, it was losing way too much power trying to make, you know, it was hitting them too straight on. And then, and uh, that, that's why if you look at these old escapements, they have much heavier weights than the deadbeat escapement. Anybody have any questions on these anchors before we go to the deadbeat? I guess not. Okay, so that's the uh, the deadbeat. Uh, so we, we can quickly look at the pallet faces and you'll see that there's a, a small amount of wear there. Uh, I can't really feel it much with my tweezers. It just, it's just more of a polished. And the same thing on the, uh, on the exit one. So they were usually made at a pretty good steel. And if you try to bend them, a lot of times they'll break, but you shouldn't be bending them anyway. So, so it's pretty easy to make this jig. I just uh, machined a groove, made a hole for the, uh, for the escapement. And the reason I put this piece of brass on the top, because I wanted to make sure the escapement was vertical both directions. And then I drilled a hole and then I got a slot, a slot here so I can play with turning, adjusting it in and out. So that is our anchor escapement. So, as we can see, there's a lot of power loss in that design. Okay, yeah. this is uh, this is the Graham deadbeat escapement. Uh, he he studied the uh, anchor escapement and seen the flaws in it. So in seven in 1720, he come up with the deadbeat escapement. Uh, and it's capable of time within a minute or better over a year if, if you adjust them properly. So what he figured out that a recoil escapement, the train of a clock to reverse this direction recoil. So it's, it's forcing the gears backwards during that short recoil. 
And for a short period of time, the move is actually wound up tight by the pendulum movement because the pendulum is actually still trying to swing in one direction. The escapement's trying to force it in another direction. So there's, there's energy lost because the, the pallets are being forced against the escape wheel. So Graham realized that a large part of the variation and frictional losses could be reduced by removing the recoil. So that was his goal. He actually took out the recoil. So recoil was eliminated by presenting a dead face to the escape wheel during this supplementary arc. So the face is dead. Uh, the, the, uh, the tooth comes up, hits the dead face. Now you say, well, it's curved. And we're, I'm going to show you why that's curved. The uh, it this actually this this is the center point, and this actually makes a curve. Now there's a. I'm going to show you on page twelve what he did. So this is your anchor escapement, the whole thing. So what he did is he realized he needed a curve because it's being pivoted up here. So the two dark areas, he eliminated, which gives you that dead beat action. So if we, uh, I'm gonna go back to that anchor escapement a bit, one more time. So if, if we remember when we look at this anchor escapement, I don't know if you remember, but oh, I got to magnify you again. So when that escape wheel is turning, again, it's turning counterclockwise. And you notice when that pendulum keeps turning, the pendulum moves, that escape wheel moves. It moves on that face and it moves on the other one, on the exit. And that, that causes the recoil. Now, if we look at a deadbeat, this goes clockwise. This one over here is your entrance and it's a very small pallet face. And this is your exit, a very small pallet face. So I'm gonna put the uh, this escape tooth into the thing. And I'm going to hold it there. Now I'm going to move the pendulum. And you see what happens? The escape wheel doesn't move. That's why it's curved. So it can rock back and forth. So you have no recoil left because the escape wheel stays stable. And, uh, and the same thing on, uh, you see that happening on the, on the exit one. The escape wheel is not forced to move. That's why it's a curved surface. So he was pretty creative when he figured that out because the, the faces form a true arc around this pivot point. So, so it's not allowing a force and movement of the escape wheel in any direction when the pendulum is swinging. Uh, so the timekeeping is a lot better. And the other thing, once he got rid of that recoil, now the deadbeat will actually run on half the power. So let's say you had a 10 pound weight on an anchor, a five pound weight would run this same one as a deadbeat. It, Cause you, you're not wasting any power. So, so now the, the other thing that's important too is any variation in the power delivered the escapement from the escape wheel has a smaller effect because now the, we have much more stable oscillations because we're not trying to force that pendulum backwards when the escape wheel is trying to go one direction. So, you, and that's how you get much better timekeeping because it's not trying to force. And because you have much smaller pallet faces, the lock and unlock of the pendulum is a lot less or the escape wheel. So that's why you have a lot less pendulum swing. If you look at a deadbeat escapement, uh, last week we talked about it, it was only six degrees, whereas an anchor escapement, uh, they have a quite a large uh, swing.
And by doing what he did, getting rid of the recoil and redesigning this deadbeat, he introduced a new term. Like when we look at the, uh, if we go back and look at this anchor escapement, when it leaves one, after it leaves the point, one point, and you see that small space, that's called the drop. The anchor escapement had dropped because there had to be enough play to allow the to allow the teeth to clear the escape wheel and, and the escapement so that it could rotate. So now by putting a, 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 a dead face on there, we got a new term called lock. So again, we know this is going clockwise because this one is sloped this way and this face is sloped this way. So it, it just wouldn't work going, going that direction. You'd have no power. So now if we take, this is the entrance palette. So if we take that, and slide it across the face, and then it, it drops off that, and then all of a sudden you see that tooth fetches up, it fetches up over here, and the amount that it fetches up is called a lock. Now, if we look at a diagram, uh, so here we see the drop, which is a distance from the tooth going to the, that, and, now this is the lock. You can see the overlap, how much it overlaps. That lock setting is somewhat critical. If you had a really shallow lock and you had wear, it would turn into an anchor escapement because you would round this off and you wouldn't have it locking. Uh, some clocks need more locking than others, some makes. Uh, typically the lock is five, the same as the drop, the lock is five to 10% of the pitch. So the amount of overlap in this, but the pitch in this one is 90 thou. So somewhere between five to nine thou is how much, how much that tooth, see there is, I've got a, a you'll see a lot of lock. Like I, I just, but when it, when it drops off that point, because, Remember the pitch is the distance from here to here. So you want a tenth of uh, five to 5% five to 10% of that. And, and in this particular case, it's 90 thou. So we want five to uh, five to nine thou lock. And the lock should be equal on both sides. Uh, if escapements are made poorly or they get bent or twisted or you get escape wheel teeth bent or twisted, all those things will cause, and you'll identify that as you're looking at an escapement, you'll see that something looks odd and then you have to go through the process of checking these. The other thing that's different about the anchor escapement, Graham d figured out that you don't need as much angle of uh, it, you only need 35 degrees angle instead of 45. So if we look at this diagram here, you, you can actually see the angle. And again, now this line here represents 35 degree angle. It's the tangent circle. So, so this angle here, so the teeth coming up now are only approaching at 35. It's kind of an effective angle because as the escape wheel alters, it changes a little bit, but for a deadbeat, it's roughly 35 degrees. So what we do for that, we take 0.82 of the diameter and, and draw that circle and that gives us the 35 degrees. So, so let's quickly measure. So I'm putting the tooth tip on just before it drops off. And then I'll measure the other angle. So that would be this one. And you can see now, if you look closely, uh, 
I guess, anyway, the scribed line is right on the circle. It doesn't show up great. Uh, no, it can't even with the reflection, I can't even get. Anyway, it's right at the base of the teeth. Now I colored all these teeth black so they'd show up, but this one is showing up at 35 degrees. So to do the other side to check the angle, so I can put it across there and then it's roughly 35 degrees. So these modern day escapements are made very precise. So, so that's how you measure the angle in a deadbeat. And it's only 35 degrees. So if the lock is too great, the escapement will need more drop for the pallets to clear the escape wheel teeth. And if it was too slight, a little bit of wear could cause problems. Like you, you can polish off a, uh, like I've polished off maybe one or two thou of uh, off the face and, and not, and haven't got into too much trouble, but you have to be careful. So yeah, I have in my notes here that the average clock and error of 5% impulse angle doesn't really cause any problems. Uh, but if you're getting into precision regulators, everything has to be much better. So okay, the so next the next one we're gonna look at is the Volmi pallets, which you'll see in the grandfather clocks. Uh, not uh, anniversary clocks, not grandfather clocks. So these are a form of a deadbeat. It's just that they're adjustable. Each one of these pallets have screws that you can take them out, adjust them. And you notice again, the curved surface, because that, that has to be a perfect circle on this escape wheel. So this, this one goes counterclockwise. So you can see the entrance pallet over here and the angle. So it's gonna rotate and then you'll see, you'll see it lock. You'll see the lock happen over here. And then the pendulum will keep swinging a little bit to unlock it and then it will turn it. And then now you'll see it want to lock over here. So, so let's test our theory on, on the lock. So in this one, I, I, I'm pushing the escape wheel against, against this side. So we've got the escape wheel, but you can see as I rotate that back and forth, the escape wheel doesn't move. So again, no recoil. And so we can do it again on the exit pallet over here. I'll hold the escape wheel tooth and slide it back and forth. And again, no recoil or no movement. So it's a true deadbeat. And we can check the angles the exact same way. Uh, like I, I can see the mark that I put. It's right at the base of these teeth uh, for, the, for the angle. So you measure it the identical way that we did for this one. So, so the amount of lock for this one, again, it's a smaller one. <clears throat> the pitch is 110,000. So somewhere between five and uh, 11,000 would be the amount of lock that you would look for when that escape wheel is coming up and fetching, fetching up. And then the escape wheel or the pendulum keeps moving a little bit and then it unlocks. And that's where you get the push. You can see, see it move when I'm turning the, escape wheel tooth across that angle. You can see the little push that I'm getting. And the same thing is if I look at the exit one, you can see it wanting to move. You see the uh, the escapement moving and that's the kick that you get out of the <clears throat> escapement that goes down the crutch and moves the pendulum. So that's those three kinds. So let's, uh, Go on to the next one. The next one, oh, I got a, this is called a Brocott escapement. You'll see that in a lot of open face Ansonia clocks. And uh, 
it's another common type. <clears throat> uh, I kind of like these. The uh, let's quickly. Well, I'll quickly show you what it is, and then we can. So this has. If you look at a profile view, so you have a round, a round uh, palette, but it's it's cut in half. Only half of it is left. Uh, I don't know if we can get a a better angle of it. Yeah, there you can kind of see. You can see that half of it is cut away. So, again, because of the pitch. Now I'll put it down and you can actually see it work. Most people would think that the flat surfaces are the actual working surface, but they're not. The round, the round piece is the pallet face. This escape wheel is going clockwise. <clears throat> so this is the entrance. So it hits that round face and locks, slides down the bottom half, and pushes the uh, escapement away. <clears throat> and then it comes over here and you can see it locking. And the reason, so when they're making these pins, they take into account the uh, pitch, which is the measurement between the two points. They make the diameter, take half of it away, but you have to make the diameter for that pin less than what you want for a drop because there is a drop, if I can get my finger in here. So when that comes off, uh, this one's got power in it, so it doesn't want to cooperate. Anyway, there's a small amount of drop You, you can see it hitting the face here. Well, actually, you can actually hear this one click. Now, this is an old movement I found in a box. It took me quite a while to get it going. Everything was bent. You can look here. You can see how this, to me, looks bent. And uh, so when you're setting these up, what you have to do to make these, the starting point to make these work is, now be really careful. The French, a lot of these French clocks, these pallets were jewels and they're glued in there with uh, shellac. And if you don't heat that up, don't try to turn them because they'll split. Now this particular one, this is a New Haven one and they're actually steel pins and I can show you Now I've already moved these. So there I rotated that quite a piece. You can see how much I rotated it and you see it won't turn because the, the lock and the drop, everything is kind of messed up. So what you do, so how these are set up is you run a line through the center of the escape wheel and you can see the angle that that's off. So what I got to do is turn that There, now that's that's pretty close. I gotta put my magnifier on so I can see. I actually went a little bit too much. So now that should run again. There, you can see it running now. So, and you do the same thing for the other one. Again, this movement's got so many problems that, uh, so what we want to do is set this one up for the right angle. And when you do that, you got to, 
So that will get you really close and then you can fine tune it like when you're measuring those angles. So, so the angle goes down the straight side through the center of your escape. Well, even that, you can see how much play that's got. So, so that's how you set up a bro cart. And hopefully yours isn't all bent, but this is just a demonstration movement that I use to. Uh... So the drop on this one, because it's a 90 thou pitch, it uh, should be somewhere between four and nine thou would be a man of drop. And the same thing with the lock. Usually you don't have too much trouble with these unless somebody was in there trying to bend stuff to get it to work that didn't know what they were doing. Now, what you can do, as I just demonstrated there, you can play with rotating, like these lines represent the flat face. So you can vary the drop off point by a slight adjustment. Now, I mean a slight adjustment of the palette. So you can actually, like you can see with it set here, it's not going to drop off because this is the tip of the escape wheel tooth. So if you put it over here, it would drop off. So you, you can play with it a little bit to, uh, to adjust that. The next one that we're going to look at, this is the American bench strip. It's called a bench strip just simply because it's a piece of metal bent. And uh, this is a, a new example of uh, an American bench strip. They call this the saddle, and it's riveted onto the bench strip, and it has holes in it, and it swivels back and forth on that. Now, this this would be the uh, the entrance. Uh, yeah, see, this is an anchor because you can see as I hold that and move it back and forth. That's not a curved surface. So the, uh, the escape wheel is wanting to move. So, so that's really an, an anchor escapement. And you can see the other one, how it moves. So you just put a tooth up against the pallet face. Now some of these came in half anchor, half dead beat. They come in quite a variety. And this is an old, uh, well, actually I'll show you with myself, look on the other camera, you can see the different types and they give you a rough idea. Like number one is used for an Ansonia schoolhouse, but they're all different, slightly different shapes. So when you're looking for one, you have to find one that fits the same criteria. So all your American clocks have this type of escapement. Uh, for some reason, they call it a verge. Uh, it's not a true verge. A true verge escapement is the one with the paddles on it, the two paddles and uses a crown wheel, but they, they want to call this one a verge. And it's fitted with a stirrup with holes for pivoting and hangs on a, you can see here, that it hangs on the steel post. And, and you can see where it actually swivels back and forth. Uh, the, the one other thing you'll find people like, because if you take, you notice the, uh, if you look in here, you'll see a rivet and an arm coming out. And that's where that, this, this arm is just a friction fit. I'm holding the escape wheel because it's wound up. So that will actually come off that stirrup. So you can actually, you can actually swivel that. Uh, there's really not much reason to and control the depth of the escapement, which controls your lock. So sometimes it's harder to undo what somebody did that doesn't know what they're doing than to actually fix. Oh, now my strike is going. So you can actually see there's, uh, there's quite a bit of lock as, as we swing that back and forth. So the pendulum, so the more lock you have, the more overlap you have up here, 
the further that pendulum has to swing to unlock. But most, uh, most American pendulums swing quite a bit, uh, you know, for a short pendulum. They're fairly unforgiving. And one of the reasons they're unforgiving is because they have such a, a powerful spring that they power themselves through. Now, you, you can see, you watch that the, the pivot for the escape wheel. See it going up and down? So you can see the anchor, the anchor effect forcing that. And, and that's why those pivot holes wear. You, you wouldn't think the pivot hole on the escapement would wear very much, but because it's an anchor type, it's actually forcing it backwards that little bit, and you can see it raising it up. So, so uh, sometimes you have to play with the depth of that, but it, it fo all follows the exact same principles as the deadbeat and the anchor. So you'll, uh, it, it follows the same angles. Again, you, you use the circle, and then they cut the angles for that bent strip to, to make them work. So it follows the same logic as all the other. And the last one we're gonna talk about, this is a platform balance, uh, identical to what's in uh, a pocket watch, except these are much bigger. All, any clocks uh, like that move around, you can't have a pendulum. So if it's a seagoing clock, like a ship's clock, it has to have some type of a balance. So this this is an old one that I had. The balance is still good. It does work a little bit. It's it's very dirty and dusty because it was laying in a box. I don't know what make. There's no name on it, but it's a very well made movement. Uh, just strictly time only. Uh, but you know you have your pallets. You can see the pallet forks. It's all jeweled, and these little screws. Uh, compensation for time and temperature adjustments and you know it's it's a modern balance the old balances were just strictly a round tube and they had no adjustments for the real old stuff down here you see your escape wheel going down here and your pallet forks right down in here you can see them rocking back and forth uh Everything has to have an escapement of some type and a, and a means to. Now, the the last type of escapement. That we're going to talk about. Is the auto beat. Uh, it's it's now I have one here. This is an auto beat. It, it's somebody tried to beat it up. It looks like they tried to put heat on it or glue or something because it, what they did, you can see that that, if I hold that, you can see it moves back and forth. So what they did is they put a wafer of plastic on each side. This never gets oil and some people like to oil that. And then as soon as you put oil on that, you're done. It's no longer, because there has to be enough friction in this that when the escape wheel, because this is the escapement, it's identical to the one we looked at it with the uh, the entrance and exit pallets. And you notice they're curved on the outside. So when the escape wheel kicks, kicks that pallet, this arm goes down through the, it's a pendulum crutch. So it's kicking the pendulum. So if this gets too loose, you'll no longer, the clock will run maybe for a week or two, and then it will just gradually lose power and uh, and put itself at a beat because it doesn't know how to run. So I actually have, uh, but as far as the actual design, everything is the same. And, and why they come up with that feature was when they shipped the clock, like this was in the 70s, 80s, a lot of people were buying kits and whatnot. The people didn't know how to put them in beat. So to put this in beat, what you do is you give the pendulum a big swing and then they use a special escape wheel, which I'm gonna show you now, and then it would settle out. So let's look at that. This is uh, my favorite clocks that I hate, Ergos, because they use that. Now you can see the black plastic. And if I hold the escapement, you can see that it, 
that it moves. Now this one that I had worked on, I tried to tighten these up. Uh, but how they work, they, they were pretty creative. If you look in here at the escape wheel teeth, if you look on the escape wheel teeth, you'll see a step. Now in a normal escape wheel, if you was to swing the pendulum a big swing, it would have to bottom out to the bottom of the teeth and you'd have to swing it about three feet wide for it to do that. So what they did is they put this little step on these escape wheel teeth so that when the pendulum is going down, it's actually catching on, the, on that step. So when you give it a big swing, see when I give it a big swing, every time it goes back and forth, the escape wheel is running but it's bottoming out and it will eventually equal out. So this escape wheel has to be made very precise so that it will eventually bottom out and then you'll get an equal amount and it will put itself in beat. It typically puts them in beat within, like I've seen them anywhere from six to 15%, depending on the clock based on my electronic meter. So that's how an auto beat works. So the first clue is you'll see plastic wafers at the top that's actually making a sandwich of the escapement and then you'll see this funny escape wheel with the little steps in it but those steps and the reason the steps are there so that they don't have to now the other type that i've seen they'll actually put a disc on the side of the escape wheel part way up the teeth and then the escapement hits that disc and it's the same effect as having a step so that that way what they tell you in the instructions is, is put the clock in the case, give it as wide a swing as you can in the case, and then it will balance out in a couple of minutes and it will be in beat good enough to run. So that's called an auto beat, but it's a, a dead beat escapement with this feature that allows them to, but it's always something to consider because if that gets too loose or oiled, the clock might run for a week or two, but you'll lose the kick from the escapement and you'll have problems. The only other thing we got left to do is what the title says is to put a clock in beat. And I think we're gonna save that. We'll do questions now and we'll save that piece for next week. Cause next week was, th we're gonna talk about uh, clock gears and bushings and uh, that whole theory about how you bush a clock. Anybody can drill a hole and put a bushing in. The clue is, the key is to put the bushing where the gears mesh properly so you don't lose power. So I think we'll actually put the, the beat part with that because we're, we're an hour and five minutes and we'll probably have a few questions. So Paul, if you want. So, so you understand all the, uh, the different types and how they work and how they evolve? Yes, I, I understand. I have to study more. Uh, the angle was difficult to see. Uh, but uh, it's opened my eyes to uh, what to look, uh, what I have to look when I try, I works on the escapement. Yeah, so the, uh, there's an article that you can actually, that I wrote myself from a, a bunch of other books that follows very closely to what we talked about here today. So you can read that and there's a lot of colored big pictures uh, if you do it on your computer, you can blow them up and they're much better pictures than what I could achieve with here today. I have one for you, Wendell. Uh, when you were showing us the, uh, the bushing in that uh, American movement with the strip pallet, and it looks like, uh, I presume you would replace the bushings before you would uh, be, before you'd try and do anything with the, uh, with the actual pallet and the teeth. But you're right. The first thing you would do is fix, fix up the uh, the bushings. You know, you want to get that down to a minimum. But American bench strip pallets escapements are very forgiving. Like they'll run, you know, in really bad shape. The worst thing that you get is people adjust and swing that pivot arm that's holding the escapement, and then they get it in too tight, and there's not enough play, or they get it out too far. And if you get it out too far, then it swings wide and, uh, and then it tops the escapement and bends all the teeth. Like you'll see that a lot, but, it, uh, but they're very forgiving because they have a big V8 engine in them that, you know, 
they'll literally run until they destroy themselves. Whereas a, like a nice French clock has a lot less power. And when they get dirty to a point <clears throat> that they should stop, they actually stop. So generally you have a lot less work to do to a, like a French or a much finer movement because they don't have the excess power to destroy themselves. <laughs> uh, Wendell, I, I, yeah. have a question. I have a question, Wendell. Uh, can you just say a word about what you would recommend for uh, lubrication on, on pallets? I just use clock oil, a light coat. I put a, a drop on the entrance and on the exit, and then it distributes around on the escape wheel and, you know, to give it a, a light coat of oil. And in a few months, that's going to be basically gone anyway. So it, uh, oil doesn't last a long time in the clock. Sometimes. Not real we... heavy, don't you? Sometimes some people put some grease on, on, on the teeth. No, 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 never grease. Good. The only, only place you put grease is on the stir wheel and on the hammers, the lifting hammer part on uh, the chimes, but never on, and it's gotta be the right kind of grease. I use a, a natural grease, uh, but no, all that's gonna do is gum up and collect dirt uh, on the uh, on the escapement, I, I use a, a light clock oil, 